Hi, I'm Denise Connor, the director of the Diagnostic Reasoning Block. In this video, we'll introduce you to the clinical reasoning concepts the UCSF Bridges students have learned and offer some suggestions for how you might continue to coach them in their reasoning skills in the clerkships. Let's take a look at what we might expect from a Bridges student and what concepts apply. We'll start in the middle of an HMP presentation at the very beginning of the assessment and plan. Why don't you give me your assessment and plan? Okay, um, Mrs. P is a 67-year-old woman with obesity, hypertension, and diabetes here with chronic intermittent abdominal pain. My top concern is that she may have biliary colic based on her risk factors and the on and off nature of the pain. I'm also considering peptic ulcer disease, but I think that's less likely. And I wouldn't want to miss appendicitis since that would be life-threatening, but I think that's, that's unlikely given how long this has been going on. So right now, my plan is to get an abdominal ultrasound to look for gallstones. How would you respond to the student? It's tempting to offer quick praise or jump to correcting mistakes and proposing your plan for the patient. Students can learn passively by comparing your plan with theirs, but they miss opportunities to identify what they've done well and to continue doing and where they can improve. We encourage you to point out specific strengths and areas for improvement in the student's clinical reasoning. Great. Nice presentation. There's a lot in your presentation that I would like you to keep. And particularly, I liked how you started with a summary statement that included a problem representation. I also really liked how you gave me a prioritized differential diagnosis because that really helps me understand how you think about this patient. The problem representation is a clinician's mental model for the patient's problem. It informs what questions to ask the patient and what physical exam maneuvers to perform. The problem representation is refined throughout the encounter, separating relevant information from unrelated background noise that distracts from the problem. The summary statement or one-liner at the beginning of the assessment and plan includes this problem representation. The problem representation sets the stage for the prioritized differential diagnosis, which includes a most likely, one or two less likely, and a can't miss, often life-threatening diagnosis. Asking students to prioritize, rather than just giving a laundry list of all possible diagnoses, is an easy first step to draw out their reasoning. Probing why students prioritize the differential in a certain way can highlight areas of incomplete or incorrect medical knowledge. There's a few areas where we can sharpen your clinical reasoning a little bit. And maybe you can start by thinking out loud and tell me why you thought that biliary colic is more likely than peptic ulcer disease in this patient. Um, well, I thought biliary colic over peptic ulcer disease based on her... The think aloud approach encourages students to explain the why behind their diagnostic reasoning. Fostering compare-contrast thinking when students are thinking aloud by asking why X and why not Y helps them refine their diagnostic reasoning. Let's take a step back. Let me hear your diagnostic schema for an elderly patient with abdominal pain. Well, I like to think about abdominal pain anatomically, uh, seeing if the location of the pain can give me a clue as to what might be causing it. A diagnostic schema is a systematic approach that clinicians take to tackle a complex clinical problem. It's a great start. The problem with an anatomical approach in abdominal pain can be that it can lead to anchoring. Mm. That you can start thinking that it's related to a specific abdominal organ, whether, whereas the cause of the pain might not be within the abdomen at all. Oh, okay. So like if it's actually a typical angina instead of a GI problem. Um, I hadn't yeah. thought of that. And, and she does have some risk factors with her diabetes and hypertension. Anchoring is a common cognitive bias. Clinicians get fixed on a diagnosis and are not able to consider contradicting evidence. Discussing the risk of errors is a useful way to expand students' knowledge and challenge their reasoning. What else is in your illness script for atypical angina? Okay, um, it's often seen in women and people with diabetes, and I think the elderly, where instead of the usual substernal chest pain, they can have other symptoms like abdominal pain or sometimes nausea. Excellent. Illness scripts are our mental models of disease, the three by five cards we carry in our minds for different illnesses. The basic information scripts contain is fairly consistent. Who gets this disease? What's the time course and tempo? What are the key signs and symptoms? What's the basic pathophysiology? By eliciting student scripts, you can uncover how they organize and prioritize information and help them refine their knowledge. The one thing that I would add to your illness script is that a typical angina, just like typical angina, is oftentimes exertional. And that would be really unlikely in other causes of abdominal pain. So you may want to ask her about that. 
Okay, makes sense, thanks. This brief introduction was meant to offer you some suggestions for how to coach clinical reasoning in the clerkships. If you'd like to learn more, please visit the Bridges Faculty Development website.